A story I'd like to tell you, um, it's about a year old, um, and I'm not the first one that's told this story, but um, if you think back to the earthquake in China uh, last year, what was really interesting about that from a media and technology perspective was within seconds of it happening, people were using their mobile devices to post pictures of the devastation and the damage um, on, on the internet. So the world learned about it um, before it be before it was something that the Chinese uh, media released to the world. Uh, so there was a flood, there was existing news, there were immediate uh, pictures and photographs. and. Um, what was really interesting is that the Chinese government decided not to shut it down. Uh, they decided to let it go. And if you remember in previous earthquakes, it would sometimes take weeks or months for the rest of the world to find out that it even happened. Um, but what was really interesting was the radicalizing effect um, that certain practices in China had on the populace. If you remember the news stories about um, the school buildings collapsing in Shezhuan province and people realizing or uncovering the fact that school officials had, corrupt school officials had taken bribes to... Um, and, and had cut corners so that the schools weren't built to code. So all of a sudden, the Chinese government was dealing with a whole with a with a huge part of their population, and given the one child per uh, family policy, had just lost their entire next generation. So you've got a radicalized populace that are sending these images, these messages, these stories out to the world. So the Chinese government had to do something about it. So they shut them down, and they started to arrest protesters. Um, people talk about the Great Firewall in China, and just a few assumptions because I'm going to link this to schooling, and you may not like what you're going here. Um, the Great Firewall of China assumes that media is produced by professionals, news comes from the outside world or, you know, from uh, expert sources, news is presented in bite-sized chunks and news moves fairly slowly. With the earthquake, that disrupted it, you know, with the citizen photos and stories on the web, um, China's, uh, what happened in China was immediately available to the world, it was uncensored, it was an uncontrolled flood and it was immediate. I'm going to suggest that we need to think about the great firewall that's built around our schooling systems. Um, the, these assumptions may sound familiar. Uh, the great firewall of schooling assumes that knowledge is only created by professionals, that information comes from experts um, and it's delivered. Uh, we only use approved sources, that information needs to be delivered in small manageable chunks, and that the transfer needs to be relatively slow and measured, and that we have to have some kinds of systems in place to make sure that the transfer has been complete. Social media and, social, and knowledge building uh, technologies disrupts these assumptions. It also disrupts the culture of schooling because with today's technologies, the people in the schools, the short people formerly known as the audience, um, they all of a sudden can talk to each other. They can be the ones producing the knowledge and putting it out there for the world to see. Um, information can come into the school from many sources. And, and, you know, we can speak about the quality of that information and what our role is as, as teachers in helping kids make good choices and to, to identify good information from bad information. But there's also a huge knowledge base out there um, that all of a sudden students and teachers and leaders and uh, jurisdiction personnel have access to unless that great wall is built around schooling. And you know what I'm talking about. You're ta I'm talking about, in some cases, firewalls preventing um, students and, and teachers from accessing this rich knowledge base. But it's also some of the firewalls we build around our practices. And those firewalls are that information delivery approach that we're so, uh, that's so familiar and that we're so, um, so it's so hard to disrupt in schools. And it's also an assessment culture that we're very committed to, or I would say it's an unholy addiction uh, to some of our assessment practices that, that do have a huge impact on how teaching and learning is practiced in schools. Um, the social media networks also give uh, students and teachers immediate access to the latest information and knowledge, but only if they have, um, only if the spigot hasn't been turned off. Um, so I think one of the big questions uh, about social networking and digital technologies that we have to ask um, is how can we make best use of the media even though it means changing the way we have always done school.
because the choice isn't whether uh, we're going to use this media environment or not. Uh, this is the media environment that we have. It's increasingly global, it's increasingly social, it's ubiquitous, and it's becoming really inexpensive. The $200 or $100 laptop, uh, one laptop per child project, well, you know, there are $20 and $30 laptops being produced in India and China right now. Um, you know, smart technologies with, that use big interactive whiteboards, well, we don't even need that technology anymore because we can use any screen as an interactive space. So these technologies are becoming so inexpensive, um, but they're still not permeating that um, rigid boundary between uh, public and between schooling. So today's schools are less and less about crafting a single message for individuals to consume, and it's more and more about convening groups around good ideas. And it's more and more about engaging the kids in our schools with kids beyond the school. Uh, so it's not just thinking about how can we do be better within our building, it's how can we do better at connecting with expertise beyond our buildings? How can we do better um, at exploiting, if I can use that word, and it's really uncomfortable to use it with children, but think about it this way. How can we exploit the knowledge that they already bring? How can we recognize and value and uh, use effectively for learning the diversity and the, the culture and the language that they already bring uh, to school? So not just for the community knowledge to be built in that classroom, but then to also build that information, or sorry, build that knowledge beyond the classroom. Um, so it does take discipline to make mature use of 21st century um, media and technologies in schools. I'd like to turn to um, some of the research on how it can work and what, the, what are the differences that make a difference. Um, I hope that you do take the chance to read the, the paper that Sharon um, prepared. I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I'm going to talk about some of the key differences um, that make a difference. One of, the, um, one of the things that we need to focus on when technology comes to school is engagement. Uh, so Prudence talked about boring. When we talked to some of the high school students in our study, um, we asked them to describe a typical school day. And they said, blah, 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 test, blah, 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 go home. <laughs> and homework is read the chapter and answer the questions at the end. Um, and we asked them, well, are you allowed to use uh, the devices that you bring to school for your learning? And they just laughed. I said, are you kidding? We have to put those away or keep them in our lockers. So I'm thinking, okay, so we're saying that we can't afford to put a laptop in every child's hand, but they're already bringing a major uh, interactive uh, media device with them to school. We can figure out ways how to use these technologies better. Um, when we think about engagement, we do have, and this speaks to Ben's point earlier, there is a lot that we know from the research on what works well. And one of the things that we do know is that engagement increases when there are several things pr present. We've measured this at four different um, laptop schools, and we've also measured this at the high schools that we visited um, over the two-year study. We found that engagement increases when uh, the types of instructional practices are sound, that the nature of the work that students are asked to do is meaningful, challenging, and authentic, that the types of technologies that students utilize in their learning are used appropriately, and they're used creatively, and they're used imaginatively. Um, they're not just layered on to what we've always done. Um, and the amount and the type of ongo ongoing feedback that students receive about their uh, learning and their achievements and their progress is both formative and summative, and it doesn't just come from the teacher. So, what do those things look like? Well, let's start with the first one. What do instructional practices look like um, when things are done differently at school? Um, one of the measures that we applied, and let me just find it here, we took a look at um, instructional so styles that ranged from a very uh, broadcast approach to the inter interactive <laughs> approach to the participatory approach. And we found a strong positive correlation between uh, very responsive and, and flexible teaching styles that focused on participation and getting everyone's ideas on the table. We found a strong correlation between that and the type of task that was designed. So students are asked to engage in work where their ideas matter and that they're asked to come up with new ideas. When I talk about the, the most important 21st century skill being knowledge, building, that's when we ask students to engage with us in improving the ideas, improving the knowledge itself. 
Um, Carl Breiter wrote a beautiful, um, has written, written several uh, pieces on whether or not children can engage in this act of idea creation. Why do we make kids wait until graduate school when we ask them to engage in their first act of knowledge creation? We can do it in kindergarten. We, in fact, we do it at home um, with little kids as soon as they, um, as soon as they start to uh, interact back with us. Um, so that's two things. The strong correlation between teaching practices, a strong correlation um, also uh, was measured between um, the type of tasks that we're asking students to do and the nature of the cognitive investment that we're requiring of them. And then um, the, the third thing was um, the relationship with engagement. So when we had a responsible, or responsible, responsive, flexible teacher who was using technology appropriately and well in the support of rigorous and great tasks where students were um, expected to come up with ideas and then the assessment practices focused on idea improvement, um, student engagement went up. So we know these things. We know how to do it. Um, how did teachers learn how to do it? Well, in the contexts that we studied, um, the teachers were supported in professional conversations. They were supported in deprivatizing their practices. So they were asked to come to, um, to staff meetings or regular meetings uh, with the research team with evidence of practice. They were asked to come with their designs. They were asked to come with their assessment rubrics. They were asked to come with their ideas. And teachers sat around and had uh, professional uh, conversations about what was working, what wasn't working, what they needed help with, and they were supported in that kind of risk taking. They were supported in that kind of um, conversation about how to improve their practices. So it was less about the individual and it was more about huh, idea improvement in a professional community. So the teachers themselves were engaged in the task of knowledge building and idea improvement. Um, so uh, the teachers valued, in the studies that uh, Sharon and I did, teachers valued being a part of that professional community. They benefited from making the learning visible to colleagues and sharing um, ideas about inquiry and technology integration um, and engagement with each other. Um, and they also improved their instruction. Now I want to make a link with, um, with equity before I uh, finish my remarks, and that is one of the things that we observe time and time again, and I, um, I don't know these numbers off by heart yet, and maybe I should start memorizing them, but I just don't learn that way. Um, we looked at uh, the work of over 1,400 students, and we looked at the work um, of, actually it was 1,500 students, and we looked at the um, practices of over 70 teachers. Um, what we found was at the beginning of the year, the teachers seemed to have a pretty good idea of who the struggling learners were, who the dead ordinary or average learners were. They weren't dead yet, but uh, they were bored. But And then the high achieving students. And, and when they were engaged in this type of knowledge building task, using technology in appropriate ways and in instructional settings where they got access to each other's ideas, they got access to expertise and expert ideas from online environments, as well as continuing to use uh, the readily available resources in their school, so this isn't an argument against textbooks. Um, the differences between the three groups faded over time. So the kids that struggled in the beginning, um, and it does take time to build this kind of trusting, knowledge-building culture in a classroom, um, but the kids that struggled and the kids that were doing really well and the ones in the middle, they were participating in idea creation together. So the differences began to fade over the year. I'm not going to suggest that all of the um, inequities were solved, but uh, what I will argue is this. When we design learning environments like this, everyone benefits. When we observed um, in classrooms, we found that of the classrooms we observed in the first year of our study of high school students, only six of those classrooms, we observed um, 33 classrooms the first year, six of them had evidence of the kind of practices that I'm describing, 27 didn't. Um, so some of the practices in the six high school classrooms um, were pretty amazing. And part, one of the biggest changes that we observed was that kids had an opportunity to talk to each other um, and to share their ideas and to use technology in appropriate ways. In the 27 um, other classrooms, we observed some fantastic teaching. But you know what? There isn't a, a link between just teaching better and increasing student engagement because we saw some pretty active, pretty enthusiastic, pretty engaged teachers at the front of the classroom who performed for 45 minutes and the kids were like <laughs> but in classrooms where you know as you know as informed and as educated and as as smart teachers um, 
they uh, instead, you know, set the students to doing the work and set the students to having that kind of conversation with, with each other. And then the, stu or the teacher worked with these different groups, the small groups, the large groups, uh, whatever made sense for the learning that was expected to occur, uh, the students were a lot more engaged. And they could also articulate what they were learning. They were, could articulate why they were learning it. They could articulate where they were finding their information and what made one idea better or more relevant than the others. So relationships matter, uh, technology matters, and Calvin won't like it when I say this, but it's not just a tool, it's way more than that. It's a cultural force. It's disrupting the way we relate to each other, it's disrupting the way we connect to each other, and those disruptions can be used in a positive way in schools.